volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Wainwright. Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 25. The Whispering Gallery. When at last I came back to a sense of life and being, my face was wet, but wet, as I soon knew, with tears. How long this state of insensibility lasted, it is quite impossible for me now to say. I had no means left to me of taking any account of time. Never since the creation of the world had such a solitude as mine existed. I was completely abandoned. After my fall, I lost much blood. I felt myself flooded with the life-giving fluid. My first sensation was perhaps a natural one. Why was I not dead? Because I was alive, there was something left to do. I tried to make up my mind to think no longer. As far as I was able, I drove away all ideas and utterly overcome by pain and grief, I crouched against the granite wall. I just commenced to feel the fainting coming on again and the sensation that this was the last struggle before complete annihilation when on a sudden a violent uproar reached my ears it had some resemblance to the prolonged rumbling voice of thunder and i clearly distinguished sonorous voices lost one after the other in the distant depths of the gulf whence came this noise naturally it was to be supposed from new phenomena which were taking place in the bosom of the solid mass of mother earth the explosion of some gases vapor or the fall of some solid of the granite or other rock. Again, I listened with deep attention. I was extremely anxious to hear if this strange and inexplicable sound was likely to be renewed. A whole quarter of an hour elapsed in painful expectation. Deep and solemn silence reigned in the tunnel. So still that I could hear the beatings of my own heart. I waited, waited with a strange kind of hopefulness. Suddenly, my ear, which leaned accidentally against the wall, appeared to catch, as it were, the faintest echo of a sound. I thought that I heard vague, incoherent, and distant voices. I quivered all over with excitement and hope. It must be hallucination, I cried. It cannot be. It is not true. But no, by listening more attentively, I really did convince myself that what I heard was truly the sound of human voices. To make any meaning out of the sound, however, was beyond my power. I was too weak even to hear distinctly. Still, it was a positive fact that someone was speaking. Of that I was quite certain. There was a moment of fear. A dread fell upon my soul that it might be my own words brought back to me by a distant echo. Perhaps, without knowing it, I might have been crying aloud. I resolutely closed my lips and once more placed my ear to the huge granite wall. 
yes for certain it was in truth the sound of human voices i now by the exercise of great determination dragged myself along the sides of the cavern until i reached a point where i could hear more distinctly but though i could detect the sound i could only make out uncertain strange and incomprehensible words they reached my ear as if they had been spoken in a low tone murmured as if it were afar off at last i made out the word for lorad repeated several times in a tone betokening great mental anguish and sorrow what could this word mean and who was speaking it it must be either my uncle or the guide hans if therefore i could hear them they must surely be able to hear me help i cried at the top of my voice help i am dying i then listened with scarcely a breath i panted with the slightest sound in the darkness a cry a sigh a question but silence reigned supreme no answer came in this way some minutes passed a whole flood of ideas flashed through my mind i began to fear that my voice weakened by sickness and suffering could not reach my companions who were in search for me it must be they said i cried who else could by any possibility be buried a hundred miles below the level of the earth the mere supposition was preposterous i began therefore to listen again with the most breathless attention as i moved my ears along the side of the place i was in i found a mathematical point as it were where the voices appeared to attain their maximum of intensity the word for lorad again distinctly reached my ear then came again that rolling noise like thunder which had awakened me out of my torpor i begin to understand i said to myself after some little time devoted to reflection it is not through the solid mass that the sound reaches my ears the walls of my cavernous retreat are of solid granite and the most fearful explosion would not make uproar enough to penetrate them the sound must come along the gallery itself the place i was in must possess some peculiar acoustic properties of its own again i listened and this time yes this time i heard my name distinctly pronounced cast as it were into space it was my uncle the professor who was speaking he was in conversation with the guide and the word which had so often reached my ear for lorad was a danish word then i understood it all in order to make myself heard i too must speak as it were along the side of the gallery which would carry the sound of my voice just as the wire carries the electric fluid from point to point but there was no time to lose if my companions were only to remove a few feet from where they stood the acoustic effect would be over my whispering gallery would be destroyed i again therefore crawled towards the wall 
and said as clearly and distinctly as I could, Uncle Hardwig, I then awaited a reply. Sound does not possess the property of traveling with such extreme rapidity. Besides, the density of the air at that depth from light and motion was very far from adding to the rapidity of circulation. Several seconds elapsed, which, to my excited imagination, appeared ages, and these words reached my eager ears and moved my wildly beating heart. Harry, my boy, is that you? A short delay between question and answer. Yes, yes. Where are you? Lost. And your lamp? Out. But the guiding stream is lost. Keep your courage, Harry. We will do our best. One moment, my uncle, I cried. I have no longer strength to answer your questions, but for heaven's sake, do you continue to speak to me? Absolute silence, I felt, would be annihilation. Keep up your courage, said my uncle. As you are so weak, do not speak. We have been searching for you in all directions, but by going upwards and downwards in the gallery, my dear boy, I had begun to give over all hope. And you can never know what bitter tears of sorrow and regret I have shed. At last, supposing you to be still on the road beside Hansbach, we again descended, firing off guns as signals. Now, however, we have found you, and that our voices reach each other, it may be a long time before we actually meet. We are conversing by means of some extraordinary acoustic arrangement of the labyrinth. But do not despair, my dear boy. It is something gained even to hear each other. While he was speaking, my brain was at work reflecting a certain undefined hope, vague and shapeless as yet, made my heart beat wildly. In the first place, it was absolutely necessary for me to know one thing. I once more, therefore, leaned my head against the wall, which I almost touched with my lips and again spoke. Uncle, my boy, was his answer after a few moments. Is it the utmost consequence that we should know how far we are asunder? That is not difficult. You have your chronometer at hand, I asked. Certainly. Well, take it into your hand, pronounce my name, noting exactly the second at which you speak. I will reply as soon as I hear your words, and you will then note exactly the moment at which my reply reaches you. Very good. And the meantime between my question and your answer will be the time occupied by my voice in reaching you. That is exactly what I mean, uncle, was my eager reply. Are you ready? Yes. Well, make ready. I am about to pronounce your name, said the professor. 
i applied my ear close to the sides of the cavernous gallery and as soon as the word harry reached my ear i turned round and placing my lips to the wall repeated the sound forty seconds said my uncle there has elapsed forty seconds between the two words the sound therefore takes twenty seconds to ascend now allowing a thousand and twenty feet for every second we have twenty thousand four hundred feet a league and a half and one-eighth these words fell on my soul like a kind of death knell a league and a half i muttered in a low and despairing voice it shall be got over my boy cried my uncle in a cheery tone depend on us but do you know whether to ascend or descend i asked faintly enough we have to descend and i will tell you why you have reached a vast open space a kind of bare crossroad from which galleries diverge in every direction that in which you are now lying must necessarily bring you to this point for it appears that all these mighty fissures these fractures of the globe's interior radiate from the vast cavern which we at this moment occupy rouse yourself then have courage and continue your route walk if you can if not drag yourself along slide if nothing else is possible the slope must be rather rapid and you will find strong arms to receive you at the end of your journey make a start like a good fellow these words served to rouse some kind of courage in my sinking frame farewell for the present good uncle i am about to take my departure as soon as i start our voices will cease to commingle farewell then until we meet again i do harry until we say welcome sure were the last words which reached my anxious ears before i commenced my weary and almost hopeless journey this wonderful and surprising conversation which took place through the vast mass of the earth's labyrinth these words exchanged the speakers being about five miles apart ended with hopeful and pleasant expressions i breathed one more prayer to heaven i sent up words of thanksgiving believing in my inmost heart that he had led me to the only place where the voices of my friends could reach my ears this apparently astounding acoustic mystery is easily explainable by simple natural laws it aroused from the conductibility of the rock there are many instances of this singular propagation of sound which are not perceptible in its less immediate positions in the interior gallery of st paul's and amid the curious caverns in sicily these phenomena are observable the most marvelous of them all is known as the ear of dionysus these memories of the past of my early reading and studies came fresh to my thoughts moreover 
I began to reason that if my uncle and I could communicate at such great a distance, no serious obstacle could exist between us. All I had to do was to follow the direction whence the sound had reached me, and, logically putting it, I must reach him if my strength did not fail. I accordingly rose to my feet. I soon found, however, that I could not walk, that I must drag myself along. The slope, as I expected, was very rapid, but I allowed myself to slip down. Soon the rapidity of the descent began to assume frightful proportions and menaced a fearful fall. I clutched at the sides, I grasped at projections of rocks, I threw myself backwards all in vain. My weakness was so great I could do nothing to save myself. Suddenly, earth failed me. I was first launched into a dark and gloomy void. I then struck against the projecting asperities of a vertical gallery, a perfect well. My head bounded against a pointed rock, and I lost all knowledge of existence. As far as I was concerned, death had claimed me for his own. End of chapter 25 Reading by Simon Wainwright